Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's a great pleasure and honor to be joined by such a distinguished panel and such a distinguished number of people uh, in the room. Uh, today's session is about uh, how technology entrepreneurship uh, will contribute to Japan's emerging grand strategy. Uh, the title was inspired by a book by the Yale historian, uh, John Lewis Gaddis, who wrote a book called On Grand Strategy. His key point was that a successful grand strategy requires that aspirations and capabilities be compatible. Uh, great aspirations are fine, but to achieve them, you need great capabilities. So the question now is, have Japan's aspirations changed? Uh, does Japan have the capabilities that it needs to achieve those aspirations? What are those capabilities? Uh, how will entrepreneurship and technology development contribute to those uh, capabilities? Where do we need more private sector action, government action? And where are the opportunities for investment? I answer some of those questions in my paper about this, but these guys will have a lot to say about that as well. In my paper, one thing I said uh, was that uh, the aspirations really haven't changed. It's uh, still peace and prosperity. And I'm happy to report uh, that uh, Takako does not agree with me on that. So if I can call uh, on her to start out the uh, discussion today. Yoroshikaishimasu, thanks. Um, thank you very much, Robbie, for having me today. Um, let me just add, I don't really disagree with you. I just think that the ways in which Japan can maintain its peace, peace and prosperity, there has been a slight shift or expansion in thinking that you cannot passively um, achieve that, that there has to be more effort to um, create a more favorable environment for the country in order for that to happen. And I think that's the change in aspiration. And I'm a bit more worried about how exactly that is going to be accomplished, but that's something to discuss about right now. Um, and so I guess since I'm not an expert on technology or entrepreneurship, and I can I do I do know John Lewis Gaddis, but I don't really know technology. I try to take the safe road and try to think about what are the geopolitical challenges that are caused by changes in technology. And I understand that today's topic is regenerative AI. It seems to be the bigger topic. So I would like to think about that in terms of international politics, which is my field. Um, unfortunately, the movie has not been shown in Japan yet, but I do think many people in, the, in other countries have what, seen the movie Oppenheimer. And there has been um, reference to what is called the Oppenheimer moment in AI, that are we facing a change in technology that may go out of the scientist's hands and we may turn around to hurt us, and whether or not we're facing that with um, um, the development of AI. Obviously, um, nuclear weapons and AI are different that some might feel uncomfortable with the analogy, like one, AI is not intended to blow things up, but nuclear energy wasn't quite just that either. Um, and also the, the big difference is that um, mostly the nuclear, at least the Oppenheimer moment, was driven by government and not by individuals or private sector as it is in AI. But I do think the, um, the commonality is also very interesting and why that's the reason why people refer to it as Oppenheimer moment is that it can be used for both peaceful and military use. And also the growth is exponential and growing at a faster speed than we expected. And finally, I think this ties into today's topic that human agency and control is very important. Um, control among governments, I think, is the main actor at this point about nuclear weapons. But I think for AI, how to maintain human agency on issues of AI, how it could be used for human development and empowerment instead of being controlled by it is the challenge today. And I'm not that familiar with that in terms of entrepreneurship or technology per se. So let me just say two things. One, about the external and what you meant by um, grand strategy. Um, I think that Japan is trying to take the lead um, in developing some kind of global cooperation, club, international cooperation on issues of AI. And I think, Paul, you can tell us what's going on at the G20. But I think um, the Hiroshima AI initiative at the time of the G7 summit is the direction that Japan is taking. And I think domestically it's interesting that Japan's approach to AI is sort of more um, in the middle in a way, that it's more of a um, risk-based soft law approach uh, compared to the European model, which tends to be more holistic and hard law based. But I'm not really an expert on this. I'm not going to do that. But finally, on education. Um, 
I've been teaching for about a quarter century now, the first 18 years at the National Defense Academy of Japan, and I taught for five years at um, Columbia University in the US, and now I'm teaching at, finally at a normal Japanese institution at Gakushin University. But one thing that I think is really important for Japan's education, if I were to tie this in, is that some ways, um, what we can do through AI is so much for Japan, and yet the potential has not been um, so it has not been fulfilled. And I say this because I think one, there is almost like an English wall in a way that we might be missing out. The students might be missing out of some opportunities that are out there um, expanding rapidly because a lot of things you can gain through the changes in technology are, or information technology is basically through English. And that's something that we are uh, facing. But also I think it's just that different ways of thinking about education is very important. And I think um, that um, Japanese education tends not to be about um, empowerment or human agency. And that might be, um, I'm hoping that um, new technology that's available to the students, I think will be a challenge for us who teach to be able to um, get in a different mood and get, get the students to be in a different mode of things in terms of education. But I think it could be a good opportunity for how to empower students not just to be able to be controlled by or to access more information, but how to process that and how to empower themselves through the new AI. I think something that we have to educate for the next generation. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very broad uh, approach. I like the idea of human agency um, changing our education of students uh, toward the idea of empowerment, expressing uh, different ideas. There's a lot of social, um, uh, would call it anthropology in that too, because who says what to whom is clearly taught differently in different areas. Uh, I'd like to move next to some of the economics of all this, uh, particularly to uh, Professor Hatta. Uh, he's one of Japan's best economists ever. He, his mi microeconomic textbook is you know, the best I've ever seen. And the title is very interesting. Uh, microeconomics, market failure, and government failure. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. Sensei, could you uh, give us your uh, uh, views on uh, particularly how the labor market will affect technology diffusion. Okay, thank you. Well, um, in recent years, we often hear that the uh, Japanese universities are behind the Chinese uh, and American counterparts. Uh, and uh, every year, a sort of uh, a ranking uh, is has been coming down. Well, um, I would like to sort of point out two factors. Uh, which uh, uh, causes this relative slowdown of the Japanese uh, research in universities. Now, the, uh, the first is uh, budgetary restraint on research. Well, uh, so somewhat uh, contradictory to the, my first uh, observation, uh, in these days, every other year, just about every other year, we hear uh, J Japan, Japanese scientists win a uh, Nobel Prize. And this reflects the uh, uh, huge investment Japanese government made in uh, the growth of the science and engineering departments of national universities during the 60s. And this, uh, in numbers, this expansion was just enormous. However, the relative growth of science and engineering, I think I, I like to shorten it as S and E, um, uh, was uh, uh, reached uh, its, uh, its uh, cap in 1970. And then since then, it, it has been growing. That means the amount of uh, government uh, research uh, fund allocated to the uh, new fields like uh, IT has not been growing at the speed of the uh, general uh, science and engineering in, during the 60s. So that's one factor. Now, on top of it, I think the Japanese lifetime employment system is a cause of this uh, uh, slow growth of the Japanese research for two reasons. One is that the uh, traditional science and engineering positions of a university have been rarely reassigned to the new fields like ITs. Even if the total budget doesn't expand, 
if the you know, existing positions are reallocated to the new ones, you know, uh, new, new fields can grow. But that didn't uh, happen. And uh, uh, this is because university positions are under the system of lifetime employment with seniority, seniority, seniority payment. So professors uh, in traditional fields don't quit. I mean, the, the pay you know, keep going. Well, in the United States, the professors in traditional fields don't get uh, increase in the pay. And so there's a natural you know, turnover. And the second <coughs> uh, factor why a lifetime employment system uh, seems to uh, cause the difficulty is the lack of mobility of researchers across universities. This is also caused by the lifetime employment system. The lack of mobility occurs even at the visiting positions, which makes it difficult to fill the teaching gap once a faculty member is on leave. In the United States, professors can take a leave, a leave from the university to concentrate on research when he receives a salary from NSF. When he gets an NSF uh, fund, you know, uh, the, the salary can be paid out of the uh, research fund. Then the university uses the freed up funds to hire another visiting professor to fill the teaching gap. This contrasts with Japan, where a grant, a grant, receiving, a grant receiving professor cannot pay his own salary out of the grant, so he must continue teaching and attend the university committees. This grant system seems to reflect the lack of available visiting faculty members to fill the gap due to the lifetime employment system. Well, uh, I'd like to discuss uh, how to get out of this lifetime employment system later, but I think we, for now, uh, I'd like to conclude this. Okay, thanks very much. And it's quite interesting to me uh, that um, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology now ranked among the top 10 in the world, even though it's only 15 years old, adjusted for size. One of the reasons for this is when it was created, uh, the, uh, the politician behind it, Omi Koji, uh, insisted that the university not be under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Education and insisted that more than half of the uh, faculty be foreign. So both those two things have immensely contributed uh, to the vibrance of that particular university, even though it's a Japanese university. So there's a lot to be said for people moving around. Uh, Tejun, let me uh, pass it to you next. As a extraordinarily uh, creative entrepreneur, uh, what do you uh, have to tell us about uh, how to mobilize talent and uh, improve capabilities? Uh, yeah, um, thank you, Roby. And uh, um, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm not so optimistic about the current situation. Um, and then I, um, there are two reasons. One is um, power shift, and the second is inequality. Um, for the last half a century, we have enjoyed this, the Pax Americana world, right? And then it's changing. Um, <clears throat> it will be a, Sino, a Pax Sino Americana, and uh, maybe 20 years, 30 years later, it will be Pax Sino Indo Americana. Um, and as a person living in Japan, we will have to face the rise of the superpower, um, China. China will return to be the superpower after three, four centuries. And that's one thing. And another is the rise of inequality driven by um, the AI and all their innovations. And <coughs> you know, innovation is always a great thing, but um, <coughs> there are many um, disruptive people always. And um, so um, when these two events happen together, almost always we see um, global scale world war. And Ukraine one year ago, and then now we see what's happening in Israel, and we know Taiwan. Um, <coughs> I don't know what's going to happen. So, sir, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, I'm trying to come up with what I can do and what we can do as a community, a startup community. Um, two major topics that I would like to highlight. So one is the born global startup. So the startups which are trying to do a business globally. 
And then there has been no uh, much less such startups in Japan until very recently, but these days, um, especially in the last few years after COVID, people started um, to aim the global market. So that's one good trend, because these startups um, down the road will connect all the different stakeholders from the many other countries. So that's number one. And the number two is, um, it's called, recently it's called impact startups. And uh, we just recently launched the Impact uh, Startup Association in Japan. Um, and uh, these startups focus on social issues. Because the, you know, in the next decade, we will have more social issues in the world. And then I think um, these startups uh, will, anyway, address these issues such that uh, we can alleviate the pain that we will have to face in the next decade. So these are two things. Um, I see some people from, uh, yeah, many people from abroad today. And if you were to start a, a company uh, from now, Japan is the best place. Um, because the government now is saying that we are going to have 150 unicorns. Um, I, I think it's 100, I guess. And then, yeah, they are saying that they are going, uh, the, uh, committing like 100 billion USD. So that's a huge amount. Just recently, my friend uh, who, used to be the, the um, CEO of one of the most successful startups. He quit the job and then started another company. And what I and he were agreeing is that going forward for the next um, several years or so, the best way is to raise capital in Japan and make a global team and address the global issue. So, okay, I stop here. Thanks very much. Uh, raise money in Japan, it's cheap create a global team here, abroad, many places, right. and then have a global um, uh, global startup. That's, that's kind of cool. <laughs> like yeah, the it's idea. the best way, uh, because mm -hmm. you know, the, mm -hmm. I, I, I've talked with all the private equity venture capitals in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And um, Japan, even compared with impact investors, impact investment funds, mm -hmm. Japanese institutional investors are most patient capital providers in the world. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can assure you. So, um, and it's the best place to be for startup people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only issue actually is a visa. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think it should be addressed. Uh, it should be uh, more relaxed. Mm -hmm. And then what? Can I disagree with you? Sure. <laughs> Mm -hmm. DARPA was responsible for most of the technology innovation that's happened in the United States over the last 50 years. Britain has recently tried to create a DARPA-based entity, mm -hmm. and they hired a guy who used to work for a friend of mine who was over at DARPA. Mm -hmm. Japan needs a DARPA. Mm -hmm. Thanks that's very your, much. That's your university funding. Okay. Now, Actually, the there's an interesting thing happening right now, which is the government has announced uh, an um, uh, innovation center they're starting in the old um, uh, maritime uh, self-defense force uh, research area in Ebisu, but they're going to have MIT, Tokyo University, and the Japanese government contributing all the money to this. Uh, to start this, I've talked with my MIT friends. They, this is serious. Uh, moreover, again, it's not going to be under the jurisdiction of the Japanese government. And to me, this is a one, or excuse me, under the Ministry of Education, which means it will just be very, very flexible. So I think your idea of a DARPA uh, is uh, very, very relevant, and that's the model that I think they have in mind as, as they're doing that. Paul, let me uh, uh, move over to you, because you have some stuff to say about immigration and a number of the issues we've uh, talked about here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start from outside in even though I would add that uh, Yusa and Mitsubishi brought me to Asia, so I wouldn't be in, in uh, Asia without a Japanese influence years ago. Um, I, I just came back from India. I was on the B20 Task Force for the Future of Work, Skilling, and Mobility for the G20 Summit. So uh, we spent 10 months uh, analyzing how AI and robotics will transform everything in our lives. And we wrote the policy recommendations for the G20 leaders. 
Um, and so here's a quick summary, and then I'd like to take it into Japan perspective. Um, the speed of AI and robotics is much faster than anything you're reading. Much faster. Um, we, we just don't want everyone so worried. But uh, we're trying to control the political forces. We're trying to control the economic forces. Um, summaries, there will be 50,000 black warehouses in America in two years from now. No human beings. There will be 8 million transport jobs in America uh, replaced in eight years. 94% um, of what an attorney does can be done by AI today. I just had a legal contract written on ChatGPT. Pretty good. And a lot less expensive than my attorney was going to charge me. But this is the speed we're moving. And, and our conclusion is every job is at risk. Huge opportunities to solve energy, climate change, which, by the way, we're moving to 1.7 to 2 Celsius. That's the conclusion we came out of G20. So you should be worried. Um, the speed of this is phenomenal. We recommended that every worker will need to be recertified for their skills every three to five years for the rest of their life. Every worker. Because if they don't get reskilled, AI robotics will replace them. So every worker is going to have to continuously upgrade and evolve in this new environment. Huge, huge opportunities to do so many great things, but only if we reskill. And the first issue is we need to redesign education. But the teachers have to be retaught to teach, right? Even professors that are tenured, right? So this is our big challenge. We, we're industri agrarian to industrial took 120 years. This is less than 10. So everything in our lives will transform. That was our conclusion. And we had very detailed recommendations. Some were made public. Some were confidential. Um, I'm an optimist. But everyone needs to watch this. Now, for Japan, I think the opportunity is this. We concluded that the large corporations, they're going to replace jobs with robots and AI because it's straight to the bottom line. And if you're an American CEO, you get rewarded for your two or three year survival rate. You don't care. But SMEs, small medium enterprises, and entrepreneurs and tech startups, they're nimble. They're going, to, they're going to grab technology, and they're going to grab human talent, and they're going to play with it. And so we recommended a massive increase of support for SMEs and startups in the G20, including Japan. It is a natural point. So SMEs and startups are critical to Japan's future. Um, you need to drive this as, as a very aggressive path forward. Factories are moving from China to ASEAN and India. For, for political reasons, justified, I would say, uh, as a supply chain guy. But Japan has this opportunity, I'll be real quick, Japan has the opportunity to push some of that production to Southeast Asia and India and take back part of that production to Japan if you combine robots, AIs, and foreign labor, right? This is the key. You have eight to nine million job shortages today going to 11 million very soon. So if you're willing to reconfigure, and I know the government is actually trying to now, which is a really positive trend, take Japanese talent and skill, unlock entrepreneurial energy, bring in foreign labor to blend, and bring part of the manufacturing back linked with Indian and ASEAN, to redefine the economy and the opportunity for Japan. This is something that's really a huge opportunity, but it requires radical thinking. And the last comment is, um, I'm looking at bringing Singapore startups into Japan with a certain Japanese uh, political friend's help. So micro-robotic stores, foreign labor matched with AI, with skill upgrade and cultural adaptation. We've already met with chairman of Persona Group, which is a great company, but in reverse, you need to have Japanese startups leave, build in Japan, and expand into Asia and the US, right? As the other speakers said. So you can't be a great Japanese startup if you never leave Japan, right? So this is the future of Japan. I'm still an optimist, but everything we know and do has to be redesigned starting yesterday. 
Thanks very much. Let me call on my favorite radical, uh, Professor Hatta, uh, who is quite radical on the types of reforms needed in labor markets that Paul just referred to. What do you think are the things that Japan could do to make labor markets more flexible, make technology move faster, get Japanese companies to be able to use foreign labor and then grow globally? Well, uh, earlier I mentioned, uh, well, by the way, I agree that the DARPA type uh, approach is uh, uh, very important in the modern technology. But uh, during the 60s, uh, we didn't have DARPA. And the, we did only very peaceful uh, engineering. But, but enormous investment uh, was made. And the, that uh, sort of was, in a sense, uh, uh, sort of successful in many areas. So if we can add DARPA on top of it, I think it would be great. Now, the, coming back to these uh, <coughs> labor mobility things, um, I, well, if I have time uh, later, I might mention that how uh, the lifetime employment system is, uh, uh, is, has been uh, the major obstacles for uh, spin-offs. Uh, appearing of uh, spin-off companies and the uh, uh, unicorns and the elephants. But uh, just skipping that, the, my idea of uh, <coughs> restoring uh, labor mobility is uh, as follows. A worker should be able to choose between the current lifetime employment contract and another type of uh, employment contract that guarantees a predetermined amount of severance payment if the employee is dismissed before the contract, contracted employment period. Now, this seems like a common sense, but the reason why this, was not introduced, this has not been introduced is that the, there's no guarantee that this severance payment will be paid without, uh, without uh, very uh, time-consuming uh, court procedures. So uh, to, to overcome that obstacle, I'd like to propose that the, to, ensure the, uh, and to ensure that the civilians' payment is paid without fail, a public fund like unemployment insurance fund should be created, which makes civilians' payments to the dismissed workers while requiring companies to pay in contribution to, the, uh, to its account in the fund. So when that the company is at the verge of uh, uh, the bankruptcy, the company itself doesn't have to pay this uh, severance payment. This public fund will pay. But, but uh, until then, the, every year, the companies uh, have to continue to pay, pay in contribution to this fund. That's my proposal. Okay, thanks very much. Um, in my little paper on the matter, I also proposed uh, some uh, things about uh, job changing. In, a different, in addition to the severance pay, the idea is that uh, what workers need uh, partly is um, support for the transition period, so some kind of welfare payment, but also um, introduction to new jobs and training for new jobs. So my sense is that severance package uh, should be uh, built in a way that enhances skill creation uh, as, uh, as uh, the seventh package is announced and, and, and presented. Uh, Taejun, let me ask you. Um, you have a very global workforce at your firm. Yeah. Uh, it's magnificent. Uh, you were kind enough to ask me to come in and chat a few uh, weeks ago, or a few months ago. Um, I'm very impressed with the way this Japanese-based group works with your global uh, counterparts. How do you find those global counterparts and how do you get them to work together? This is the template for the future of Japanese startups. So how, do you, how did you accomplish that? All right, um, two things. One is to find a non-Japanese speaker co-founder. It is very, very crucial. Um, if you fail to do this, it's very difficult um, because you know, uh, it's very difficult to start a company. And in the early days, if you have uh, fellow Japanese speakers, you end up making everything in Japanese. Then the, all the other people, you know, English speakers, will never come to that place because you know, they have many other options. <coughs> so that's number one. And the number two is, to, is the willingness to pay for the cost of diversity. 
I think people quite often talk a great things about diversity, right? Um, but in, in my company, um, so one third are Japanese, one third are Indian, and one third are from Europe and the other places. And for the last several years, we have continuously suffered from this, the conflicts of civilizations or cultures. Um, it's still continuing. Um, and then still, I believe this is a good thing because um, this will um, the make us um, be able to go anywhere in the world. But it's very tough. So, you know, if you're just a Japanese speaker uh, thinking of starting a company in Japan and then to make a global startup, um, you have to be ready for that. But um, I, th I think once you overcome this, it will be very easy. It's, a, it's going to be a great trip. Very good. Yeah. So in a sense, these costs of diversity are actually investments in acquiring new information. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's a wonderful book, if I can recommend it, maybe I have before, called Social Physics. Uh, by an MIT Media Lab guy, um, Alex Pentland is his name, and what he—he's a you know big data scholar, and he's looked at how teamwork works, and um, his conclusion uh, is that effective teams have three characteristics: uh, one is they talk a lot to each other, they talk equally to each other, that is everybody talks the same amount to everybody else, and third, everybody brings in external information. I uh, showed a diagram to my students at Tokyo University of Science a few months ago uh, of a bad team. So five people, two are really talking to each other a lot, and everybody else isn't kind of talking to anybody else. And the guys who have all the external information are not talking to anybody. Okay? And so I showed this diagram, and I said, is this a good team or not? I hadn't prepared them at all. Everybody in the class said, it's a terrible team. So we know this. So then the question is, how does management encourage information exchange, diversity, bringing in external uh, information? Takako, let me ask you. You've worked at the Defense Academy here in Japan, at Columbia, now at Gakushuin. How is this issue of communication uh, among faculty members bringing in external information? How is it different at, the, say, the Defense Academy or Columbia? I've never really compared the two before um, because the Defense Academy is not run by the Ministry of Education and the, um, the um, goal is to train for officers, although there was no, um, there is still no um, obligation to serve, so which is interesting that, um, but about 90% do end up serving. Um, I guess I personally, if I can, I can't really speak for the university, but uh, one thing that I observed which was interesting is that the National Defense Academy in Japan was designed to um, be taught by civilian faculty, uh, mostly. And that's one thing that I think might be, goes counter to people's expectations. So I think it was a very diverse faculty. 80% were science and techni technology, reflecting the needs. Um, but um, I think that's how external information was brought in. But for me, I made it in my own personal agenda in a way to try to open a window for the cadets going forward, because since most of them are going to become officers, they're going to be leading a group right away. I wanted them to access information when they needed to, so what I had in mind was to try to provide them with how exactly to access information when they need to. So um, that's what I tried to do, and I think there's changes over time at the academy. I was there recently, two weeks ago. I was happy to see that when I taught there, only less than 10%, I think, were female. Now I think it's going towards 20%. So I think it's already <laughs> getting more diverse. And that altogether, I think the interesting aspect of the Defense Academy experience was trying to bring the external in. Columbia, I don't really know if that's a comparison right there. But if I were to um, talk about my Gakushin experiences, I'm very fortunate to be there. And as I, I'm lucky that I'm not a tenured professor. And that's a weird way to say. But I left my tenure job at the Defense Academy to go to Columbia. And I think that gives me more freedom to teach the way I, I want to, and I teach at the International Center, and I'm trying to do something similar, which is to try to open the window and to the outside world, and I try to connect students' interests to be more global as much as possible, and I'm not bound to um, have to go to faculty meetings. I think I'm very lucky <laughs> that I'm on my own. Um, and I can try to do new things, uh, including teaching English. So I was actually interested in what you had to say, TJ, about like you have a global team. Where do you find the Japanese members? Because I'm actually more optimistic about the people we have. 
I just don't know if they know about the options out there aside from the typical places that they go job hunting. And I do think that if there's an aspiration to work where you have more agency in what you do, they might aspire to do new things while they're still in college and learn new things and get skills, but they just don't know that option. So I do hope that maybe opportunities like this. I'm very happy to be here to know what's out there for my students, for them to think about other things than just going to the typical job hunting, but, uh, and to try to see if they can expand their horizons. So that's my take on education. Thanks thank very much. Paul, let me uh, throw a little bit of a curveball uh, to you, but before I do that, I want to thank you for uh, advertising my book. I did a book a couple years ago uh, about uh, the importance of reskilling in Japan. It's called Tate to Hoko, or Sword and Shield, that is in this new world of you know crazy job changes and technology change. Uh, we've got to uh, have people reskilling themselves every year, and it's not only uh, a shield to keep yourself uh, employed, but it's also sort of a sword so that you can you know, go out and do new things. Uh, so thank you uh, for doing that. The curveball I have uh, is, uh, was inspired by a comment uh, from a person who was on a, a, an advisory board that I was on recently. And she uh, said uh, to us at the advisory board, uh, this is a Japanese woman in her, I guess, around 50s or so. And she said, boy, I'm glad I wasn't born male. Because I, as a female in Japan, I have many, many more opportunities to move around, to get paid for skills that I acquired. Um, so mobility actually has helped skill creation uh, among uh, the labor force women in Japan, labor force of women in Japan. Could I ask you to comment on uh, how you think um, mobility will help people improve skills and how you think Japan might be able to implement that a little bit faster than they are now? <coughs> Happy to put a plug in for your book. Um, yeah, reskilling is one. Mobility isn't a choice anymore. Everyone will be mobile. The average person will change jobs 12 times. Not four. Not one. So lifetime employment was a nice thing to have in the past. Um, Singapore spends 50 to 90% subsidy for any company that reskills their workers to upgrade their skills. The government of Singapore pays 50 to 90% across the board. They're not stupid, it's an investment. I've been on some Singapore government advisory committees. It's all planned through in detail, but it is a beautiful investment and they get a return on that investment. But this is what Japan, America, everyone has to start thinking about. And as a company, how do you keep employees and how do you reskill them and invest at the same time? It sounds like a dichotomy, but you have to do both. Um, mobility is, the gift of the new economy. You have to move, you have to be nimble. That's why we think small, medium enterprises and startups are, are a key to stabilizing the economy in the whole industrial countries because they're more nimble, because they're more evolving, and because people will constantly upgrade. You can't be in comfort zone when you're in that smaller play. But that's 85% of the jobs in most of our countries, by the way. We forget that. So. Um, Reskilling is essential. Uh, mobility is everyone starting now. And uh, we have to embrace this change, right? I'm an optimist, but you know, real quick, when, when you look at Silicon Valley, you know what the magic is? It's everyone, it's every culture, it's every race, it's every religion, all sharing a radical dream. Japanese, Chinese, Indian, whatever American is by definition is all of that. But it's the immigrants too. And, and by the way, what was Masayoshi-san? He studied in America. Hori-san at Harvard, and then he came back as a radical, right? So the point, the point is, we need to go overseas. We need to blend. I started a company in India, logistics parks, railroad, IT company. The first thing I did was hire foreign Indian talent to re-enter India with new ideas and thoughts, right? Not traditional in India, but outside India, come back in and help rebuild. So this is so important for Japan to bring some foreign talent in, integrate it with the best of Japanese innovation, and you're one of the best on the planet with robotics and, and healthcare and so many things. And shouldn't Japan be one of the first countries to redesign education? It's a huge opportunity. Right, and healthcare. So, so I think mobility is important, 
but you have to bring in some foreign talent, not just for construction, not just for hotel and hospitality, which we're happy to help with, by the way, but, but also to be entrepreneurs with you and Japanese talent to go overseas. I, I, I know a Japanese a young executive, and he went overseas to Singapore with a big investment bank. And, and then he said, I want to go work for a foreign company in Singapore. Why? Because I have a path that's defined in the Japanese company, but if I join a Singapore or a foreign company in Singapore, I can jump, I can maneuver. I don't have to wait 10 or 15 years. And that's exactly what he did. So I think the strength of Japan is please bring in some foreign talent and take your great talent and unlock it and reward it. And yes, as a country, reward the risks because that's the whole new economy, right? Right? And, and, and no one perfects things. We used to do 10-year budgets in, in my, my, when I came to Asia with Yusin, Mitsubishi shipping arm. But it's too safe. Right? So, so I, I think there's a lot of talent. There's one of the best technology plays in the world is in Japan. And the last two prime ministers, well, starting with Abe-san and forward, have talked about we need to move faster, we need to innovate. For national security reasons, we have to. And for economic security reasons, we have to. Yeah, I and and I, I will add what, what was mentioned earlier. This is the most dangerous period in the last 70 years. It really is. So we have to be really mm -hmm. careful how fast we move mm -hmm. um, and take advantage of unlocking potential. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. It's about time to go into Q&A. But as we do that, before we get going, uh, Sensei, may I ask you to comment on what Paul has just said about Japan's openness to foreign workers? <laughs> this is Asao Sensei. Oh, oh, well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I think we have to open up uh, the uh, the country, and then we would like to welcome anyone, um, Japanese going abroad, and also uh, foreign talents coming in, especially talented people. And um, I think this is happening. And um, one one thing that I also would like to uh, add is that um, it's a, this is a very good chance for Japan because we are losing population. In other words, you have mentioned that a lot of the jobs are being taken over by a technology, but if we are losing population, that's good. I mean, no, no one's going to be um, unemployed. Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, mobility, again, is uh, a very uh, key thing that we, ha we would have to add on. And um, I'll, again, um, we would, I would like to welcome many people coming in and start companies in Japan and also Japanese uh, ventures going abroad um, and do their business abroad. Speaking of uh, beautiful opportunities, there's a, a, a huge global problem now with forest fires. Uh, and um, a guy came to me a few weeks ago and said, I've got this great idea. We're going to have uh, global satellites identify where the forest fires are. Those, those services exist already. But what they do is they inform fire departments uh, around the world where those fires are happening and say, gee, you've got a fire. But they don't actually go and put out the fire. The problem is that the fire departments aren't close enough to actually get there and extinguish the fire. So what this guy wants to do uh, is connect this global sort of fire identification system uh, with uh, an air force of drones that can pinpoint where the fires are and go zap them before they get any bigger. Uh, the problem he's run into is his company loves the idea and they'll give him 20% of his time to work on this. Huh? No. You can't move like that. If you're going to do this, you got to do it aggressively and full time, in double time, triple time. Uh, and I don't see the the senior guys uh, having that sort of mentality about saying, "Okay, you've got a really great idea. We're going to fund this. Get together with some of our friends uh, and get it going." So there's a sort of a mindset uh, at the top that I think also needs to be a little more uh, call it entrepreneurial in this sort of thing. Um, so let me now open things up to Q&A. It's time to get going. Uh, good gosh, we've got a lot of people. Let's start on this side and go to that side. Uh, take three questions. One, two, was there another one over there? Three, okay. One, uh, one two, three. Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think people's uh, optimism is important for uh, social innovation or uh, talent mobility. 
uh, but unicorns and economic growth uh, is a kind of American style, Ameri American dream style of optimism. So do you have any ideas on how to bring optimism to Japan or uh, Japanese style of opti optimism? Maybe for uh, Tijun san or anyone. Hi, I'm uh, Hiroshi Saito from Microsoft. I would like you, uh, four members, to uh, get an opinion on this. Our CEO, uh, Satya, says that with the implementation of this general AI brings uh, the world GDP uh, up by 8 to 10 percent. How do you sense this number, 8 to 10 percent? Is it too big, is it too small, or just about right? yumi -san. Thank you. My name is Yumi Sato, and um, I organize a very aging economy uh, program. It's uh, um, we are trying to solve many problems of super a aging country, Japan, and uh, we organize an uh, age tech award. It's many. There are many startups in Japan who, uh, who trying to make good age tech, and I like to I introduce East Asia. Uh, our uh, good ASIC, and uh, I like to make a collaboration with uh, Asia about startup. No, ASIC startup. So, how to get good Japanese uh, technology to Asia? Uh, so this, this, That's this, the question, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So we have three very good uh, questions. Um, maybe let's start with the third one. Uh, TJ, can you tell us how to get Japanese good uh, aging technology to Asia? So how do you... I mean, if yeah, you have so. a great product, it's a global issue, and in China, uh, it is already a very serious issue. So if you have a good sales force, I personally feel that it's not that much difficult mm -hmm. to sell things. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of Japan, and then, and then sometimes yes, um, it, it's uh, as I said, um, if the Jap the, the company is all Japanese, uh, comprising of um, the all Japanese speaking people, it's very difficult to find a good English speaker um, mm -hmm. or a good local language speaker. Um, that could be one challenge, but once you crack this, um, I, I don't think there will be a big issue. That's what I say. So it sounds sounds like it's partly a language issue. Yeah. Things. Paul, do you have an observation on this? Great Japanese startup, but it's kind of dome dome. Like domestic, how do you get it into Asia? Marketing. Marketing. Be, be, because, because the skill that builds the technology isn't the same skill. Microphone. <clears throat> the skill that builds technology isn't the same skill that builds the market opportunity, right? So you have great technology, now you have to have great strategy and people to market mm -hmm. and build the relationship. Right, and and then the then the door immediately opens up. So I'm I, I think you can take great technology and bring it overseas, but it's not the technology person selling; it's the marketing person, right? It's the so so how how to Japan is you know has some great companies for marketing, but it also has some that aren't very great, and you need to focus more on that marketing power to unlock Japan's potential globally. And and, and a quick second comment is. Uh, to Microsoft, uh, you know, when, when you look at, at, at the speed of this, you know, quantum computing, as you know better than I do, um, one complex uh, computer program today on the best computers in America or China can take 500 years. Quantum computer can do the same formula in one day. Now imagine AI matched with quantum computing we can cure cancer, we can deal with global warming, we can have hydrogen energy, so many beautiful things to improve the world, or we have the singularity where that AI takes control of all of us around 2035 or sooner, which is what many predict. We think maybe earlier than that. So, so again, it's as humans, what is the GDP potential? Is it eight or 10? Sure, even more or less, but it's how we humans use that technology for good or bad to unlock that potential. Of course, you know that answer. Okay. Hata Sensei, uh, on the GDP and the impact of this new AI on GDP, do you have an opinion? Well, uh, two things. 
two things. One is that uh, uh, the, for Eric here, the, in Japan, probably the most needed uh, mm -hmm. innovation is the uh, application of DX in elderly care. Because mm -hmm. uh, elderly care has been handled by the government, it's, it's very inefficient. And in recent uh, study in uh, Kitakyushu, uh, from the viewpoint of applying uh, DX, they found that the, a significant amount of caregivers' time was spent on administrative tasks, such as creating records and the containing the uh, uh, and contacting the next uh, uh, caregivers almost 50 percent of the time was spent on this and this is uh, room for for the application of dx and uh, if we are successful in do, in uh, so developing this dx technology i think the room for export of uh, this uh, service uh, uh, japanese uh, experience is enormous and at your conference, uh, when you introduced the, what's happening in the Kyoto hospitals, I think it was the Kyoto Kyodai hospital on the floor of what's happening. It's just stunning what they're doing. Uh, and so if we can convert that into a, a product, that would be great. On optimism, Takago, how do we become more optimistic as a country? Um, <laughs> I thought that question was so interesting mm -hmm. um, because I have this slogan, like a magnet on my door that says, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And, and I get that, but my students ask me, why does life begin at the end of your comfort zone? So I was, does Japan, like I don't know if it's Japanese style, but do maybe there's a tendency that you have to have a certain level of stability to be optimistic. And that um, you have to have a mindset that um, we're, we've been talking about changes in diversity and um, job mobility. Um, it has to be somewhat considered to be a fun thing, not by necessity because we have less people in Japan. And I'm not too sure what exactly the answer is to that. But I do think that um, one thing that I'm trying to do, and coming back to your comparison to universities, one thing that I thought about is that um, Columbia University especially was a place where we experienced diversity and experienced how diversity is fun uh, reaching out to new things is fun. So it's like a comfortable place to challenge new things, to be optimistic. So I hope that I can do something like that at where I'm right now. That will be a chance for um, students to experience something diverse and different, to um, be in a certain comfort zone, but to try to challenge new things when they can. So okay. I don't have an answer to the optimism, but maybe there, it ha there has to be something about Just the level of stability. Sec yeah. 10 seconds will be more. Yeah, um, sure. I, I don't think optimism is so important for entrepreneurship. Um, the rather, I think passion is much, mm. much more important. I'm a very pessimistic person, always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But very passionate, yes. Oh, yeah. OK, very good. Actually, one of my young friends uh, who just started at the Sloan School at MIT uh, came back and uh, talked a little bit about her experience. And she said, this is so amazing. I know people from 61 different countries. Yeah. What a wonderful thing for somebody who grew up in, in Japan. Can we, uh, are there any questions from the web? None, okay, none at the moment. Let's move to this side. Okay, um, one, two, three. Okay, one. Thank very you quick, for please. the very inspiring talks. I'm uh, Daniel Moraro, I'm a professor actually at the National University in Japan, in electronics, by the way. And I'm very touched by what Professor Hata and uh, Professor Kiyokotani said about uh, lifetime employment and lack of mobility. So I took an MBA here at Globis, and it was a wonderful experience. I got out of my comfort zone. And my question for you is, how can we encourage the other members of the academic life, academic environment in universities in Japan to get out of their comfort zone and go for reskilling and challenge new, new approaches and new visions, let's say. Okay. Very good. Over here, I think I had someone. Yes. Yeah. Here we are. In white. Yeah. Here we are. Hi, my name is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cheryl. I'm from LinkedIn Japan. Thank you so much for your talk. So um, I'm really passionate to help people to be empowered to basic chase their dreams and uh, having their mission. And I think, as you've mentioned, lifetime employment in Japan, it's very top-down uh, approach and not allowing that. And Takako Senshi, you mentioned empowerment is not a thing uh, in education in Japan. So I kind of like wonder, my questions to you is, what does the private sector and the government 
could do to change that, to really focus on empowerment and also humanity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and back here. Hi, I'm Romain Caillot. I work in risk management, and uh, I used to live in Singapore. And uh, my question is to uh, Tejun and Paul, and it, uh, it is about uh, what risks and opportunities do you see the weak Japanese yen mm -hmm. having on the way you conduct your business or look to grow your business, whether for Tejun it is from Japan towards Southeast Asia, India, and the rest of the world, mm -hmm. and for Paul looking at, from Singapore coming into Japan. Thank you. Okay, very good. Let's, uh, let's see, how do I allocate this? Um, first, on the getting academics out of their comfort zone. Uh, should we abolish tenure, for example? Any ideas on this? What do you think? Takako, Hata Sensei? Um, well, all I can say is that American universities, the tenure system is lifelong. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, mm -hmm. it's around 65. So it's not like either or mm -hmm. question. And mm -hmm. that, um, so I think it's more of a question of mobility, how much you can. Um, move to different universities. But I do think it's changing that among younger academics, there tends to be more job mobility. But, um, mm -hmm. but I that doesn't say. Well, yeah. well, in the US, the uh, pay at the accounting uh, professor, pay of accounting professors and pay of uh, uh, English department professors are hugely different. And also, uh, at uh, say, after, uh, well, if a person becomes a professor, he must have done something. But after that, if he stops pr producing, his salary is not reduced, but uh, it's not increased, while all others uh, you know, pay, uh, keep increasing. And I think uh, that type of introduction of that type of flexibility in the Japanese pay system is a minimum thing we, we need to do. Okay, on empowerment, does anyone want, anyone want to volunteer to talk about how government and business can improve empowerment of workers? TJ? Yeah, to have more women in government main positions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, oh, that's a problem with Japanese startups. Uh, most startups are started by men. Mm -hmm. And then there are too many blind spots. So um, DEI-related um, startups, mm -hmm. uh, I think, are very good topic because that's, um, there is much less competition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, it was interesting because when uh, Prime Minister Kishida said he wanted to see 30% or more women in management positions, my response was, oh, are you going to have 30% or more LDP diet members who are women? That would be very interesting if he made that his, his uh, proposal. Um, okay, yen dollar. What to do? Well, 150 is a lot different than 112, right? It temporary, but remember, there's about $9 trillion of quantitative easing between the US, China, Japan, and Europe. That has to be rolled back. So it's very hard for us to figure out what's happening in the global economy. You have a better idea. You have a better idea than I do. But what does that quantitative easing rollback do? Because that, that had never been done in history. So how long will this yen imbalance stay? We don't know. You know. A year, two years, what? But this is an opportunity, right? If I, if I want to enter Japan, this is the way to enter Japan with, with the weaker yen and, 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 and to arbitrage labor costs and, and, and fixed and virtual assets, right? So there's a window of opportunity for one or two years to really leverage a way to play this yen before it, it hits a new equilibrium again, back to where it was eventually. So um, I think that has to be part of the strategy and the opportunity. And remember, the Shogun period was 400 years of stability. And Tokugawa-san was one of my sponsors who brought me to Asia. Interesting story. But then the Meiji Restoration was risk. It was Western influence. But it was unleashing a different Japan, right? So this is a new era for Japan to unleash itself on its terms mm -hmm. in the new economy. Thank you very much. We've ended on an optimistic note, so that's, that's great to hear. So thank you very much, all of our panelists. Please join me in thanking them, and uh, we'll move on to the next session. Thank you so much.